All right, everybody, welcome back. So, quick review of some of the things that we have just covered. We have a real space and a reciprocal space. And when we were doing in two dimensions, for instance, um, we said this being a one, this being a two, then we had a reciprocal lattice that this was B2 and this was B1. And we had that for instance, B1 was equal to two pi over A1 in the X direction and B2 is the reciprocal of A2. So that's why this is two pi over A2 in length, but it was pointing in the Y direction. So we did this for this lattice that is kind of like rectangular. If it was cubic, it's the same. If it was in a hexagonal, we did it in class two. And we have all of these vectors, right? Two dimensional, three dimensional. The important thing is that the B ones, the B i's dotted with the A j's are gonna give you two answers, two pi if i is equal to j and zero if they're not the same. So that, that was the condition on finding the b's, right? So given some real space vectors, a1, a2, a3, even if it was more than one than three dimensional, you could do this. Given those vectors, you can go and find the reciprocal vectors and they would be um, there for you. So we also drew what is, the, what is called the Breloin zone. We have the Wigner size cell for real space lattices. We take all of the points in the lattice and then we start figuring the closest neighbors, well, all of the neighbors around it and draw lines across them. And we get this uh, Wigner size lattice in real space. And we also saw that in momentum space, in reciprocal space, you will have the same thing. And it's just called the first Breloin zone. So that's the convention. Sometimes this is the first Breloin zone, right? You can go to the second Breloin zone. You can go to the third Breloin zone. Sometimes it's useful for some measurements that you're doing, for some of the theory that you might be looking at. And they all have the same area. All right. So all of this was in two dimensions. So let me quickly go over something. This is in three dimensions. We have the three vectors, A1, A2, A3. Let me do the construction of the reciprocal lattice in three dimensions. There's gonna be an area or a volume in three dimensions actually that is denoted by A1. Salud. Dotted into the vector A2 cross A3. So, if the vectors were x, y, and c, you would see that x, sorry, x, y, and c, y cross with c would give you x, dotted with x would give you one. So if you had a little cube of your a1, a2, a3, this will give you a volume of one, right? If you have something more complicated, if you have something more complicated, is gonna give you the volume of that primitive cell. So now that you have the volume, we can write the
reciprocal lattice vectors. The set of them And in this case, let me write the three of them and then the general rules, the compact version of it, but let me just write it like this. So you have two pi over omega, that volume. And then this is the vector A2 cross with A3. A2 and A3 cross with each other. If we go to the second vector, Again, is the two pi and W there. And then this one becomes A3 cross with A1. And finally, the B3 one, two pi over omega. And we're doing A1 cross with A2. Questions? So it's just like cycling through the values, right? And for those of you that like um, the notation of uh, general relativity, you can rewrite this bj with for any of the j's one, two, three is equal to one half two pi over omega. And then the Levi Chivita symbol, uh, j, k, l, a, k cross with a, l. And it's the same thing as above, right? This Levi Shibita symbol is the, this one is totally, totally anti-symmetric. Um, you guys know about this symbol? Uh, yeah, it's either one or negative one. So it's one when it's a permutation of JKL a negative one when you flip one of the orders. So that would flip those guys here, right? So you see those in maybe a special relativity and for sure in general relativity. So the important thing though, is that by construction, as you see here, the B and the, the, B and the A vectors is that, let me write this down. Any vector A dotted with any vector J is gonna be two pi times the Kronecker delta MJ. If M and J are the same, then you get two pi. If they're not, then you're not gonna get two pi. So A, the set A gives you three vectors in three dimensions. Now you have a way to get any of the Bs or all three of the Bs. There's no, this is the construction that you use. I believe that there's other ways to construct them but then it wouldn't be the convention that everybody uses. So things that are clear at this point, if you have a vector, like for instance, if you look at this vectors two up here, B1 is perpendicular to B2. No, sorry, B1 Let's say that we had a cube, right? B1 would be perpendicular to the plane that A2 and A3 make in three dimensions, right? So through this generalization that we have here for any vectors, not just the cubic unit cell vectors, we can see that if we take B1, it would be, this is the K 
an L. So if that's B1, this would be two and three, right? K and L is two and three. So if we take B1, it would be perpendicular to the plane that is made by A2 and A3. Does that make sense? Yes, no? All right, so then I brought a toys, a couple of toys. Let's see if the camera works. All right. So I brought this lattices again. So I have one right here. This is a lattice right here. And the reason I brought this lattice is because it has a funny thing on the, it's a little bit funny on the sides right here. So it's not like this simple one right here, right? This is a cubic lattice. This one has differences as you go through the planes. So this is just a cube with springs attached. So you can see the motion of the cube. Sorry? So this one is just a cube. Yeah. And then this one right here is also different from the other ones. And here I'm showing you one of the planes, but you can see as you rotate it, you can see different planes, right? So like for instance, there's this plane going through here. If I rotate it, you can see that there's like this regions right here that I can go through. And those gives us planes. So this cells right here, this is not the unit cell actually, this is a construction composed of many unit cells right here. But one of the things that I want you to see through them is, and let me pass this to you, rotate it around, grab it, look at it like this, okay? It's easier to see when you have the construction in your hand. And the reason that we have those construction is that I want you to see is that a 3D crystal the crystals that you have in your hands right now um, is basically a periodic stacking of 2D planes. So you have a crystal, three dimensional, right? If you look at it, you can see that there's planes in it. And as you see this plane, then the next plane, then the next plane, then the next plane. A good example might be graphite, which is stacking on top of each other of the planes of the hexagonal lattice, right? Well, this one is also clear once you look at it that these crystals are the stacking of 2D lattices, of 2D planes. All right, questions so far? If you look at, at a vector normal to one of the planes that we're talking about, so let's say you recognize a plane, you see the planes in your lattices. If you take a vector normal to the plane, is gonna be proportional to a reciprocal lattice vector. So that's because B1 is perpendicular to the plane made by A2 and A3, right? So it turns out that any of the planes that you can make can be spanned by the vectors. And you can see that is A2 and A3 plane, whichever, or J, K, hold on back. So yeah, any plane KL is gonna be normal to the J plane. So I say any of the planes that I have here, you play with this one? All right, so any of the, the reason I'm saying this is that any of the planes that you pick, let's say you pick, um, so right here, there's a plane of yellow ones coming across, right? So let's say you pick a plane here, the yellow ones is a plane, 
the gray ones is a plane on top and so forth, right? But we take all of these yellow ones and you tell me, well, I pick my plane and um, where's the vector that you said? Because I have A1 and A2 being these two vectors and it's not on the plane that you said. Well, you have the option of choosing new A1 and A2 vectors so that you can build any plane. Those primitive unit cells, right? They're not unique. You can make different unit cells. They just have to have the same area. So if you pick any vectors, you have a new set of the lattice vectors and with two of them are gonna be the lattice vectors on this two dimensional cell that you're in, this two dimensional plane that you're interested in. So any of the planes, you can write it as a linear combination of the original lattice vectors or make new ones up that you see and come up with the plane vectors. And then you will have a direction B1 that is perpendicular to this A2 and A3. Does that make sense? It's maybe not easy to see, but it makes sense once you see it, right? So, we talked before about this. Uh, so we had a reciprocal lattice vector. Let's say that our vector is J is gonna have three integers on it and is given by this integer K, capital K, the vector B1, plus capital L, the vector B2, plus capital M, the vector B3. So we have three integers in there. And um, we have our uh, reciprocal lattice vectors, B1, B2, B3. So if you remember from geometry, a plane is characterized by a point in the plane and a vector normal to the plane, right? So in this case, my point is gonna be little r and a vector normal to the plane. So with those two, I can rewrite what my vector is. So now we have this equation that tells us that J, G, K, L, M, dotted with the little vector with the position R, this is our point, is gonna give me zero. All right, so that's my definition from math, from geometry. I can redefine whatever the lattice is that I have, I can redefine it so that there's a lattice point in the origin, right? And I wanna put a lattice point in the origin because that makes things easier. But if not, you could add a constant that is the displacement from the origin. So we're gonna define our plane. That is perpendicular to this G. And passes through the origin. So a lattice point is out at the origin. And we know that for all lattice points, right? 
Remember the set of all lattice, lattice points is given by R, capital R. We're gonna have the G dotted with capital R. Let me put a little J because he's one of the vectors in the set. Is equal to two pi mj. So I know that this is true from our construction of the reciprocal lattice vectors, right? And because I have that and it works for all lattice points, there's a plane and then there's parallel planes. So we have our lattice point at the origin, but also next to the origin, there's gonna be this parallel set of planes. So our planes are gonna be such that we take this G, K, L, M, dotted with one of those atoms positions, and we're gonna get zero plus minus two pi, plus minus four pi, and so forth. So this would be a, the first plane, then there's two, one to the left, one to the right, or up and down, whichever way direction your G is, right? Then there's another one, then there's another one, then there's another one. And it's because of this guy right here that it can be giving me M is equal to zero, one, two, negative one, negative two, and so forth. So this equivalent planes are labeled by K, L, and M. And this K, L, and M integers are called the Miller indices. All right, so this Miller indices, J, K, and M, K, L, and M, there's one assumption that I didn't tell you before. When we build this vector, this vector is the one that has, um, is the shortest one that gives you this direction, okay? What does that mean? Like for instance, if I have a vector that goes from zero to one, and I have another vector that goes from zero to two, they have the same direction, right? So the index one, zero, zero is the same as the index two, zero, zero, but the one I wanna use is the one, one. One, zero, zero, two, zero, zero are equivalent, but they give you the same information. So this is redundant. So you just wanna use the shortest index right here. All right, so let me continue this direction. <coughs> How to find the Miller indices? So let's say that we had we have um, a set of lattice points n one, n two, n three, 
this is equal to N1, A1, N2, A2, N3. Sorry, there's no vector here. These are integers, right? N1, N2, N3. We have that set of lattice points. in a plane, then we know that there's a vector with some index KLM dotted with this vector N1, N2, N3 that has to give me, if I do the dot products of those two, A1, B1, B2, a2 and so forth, right? I'm going to have K N1 plus L N2 plus M N3, all of this multiplied by 2 pi. Or 2 pi times some integer. So up to here, it makes sense? Okay. Let's assume that this integer is not zero. If it's zero, then you have something weird. So we know that there's a new, another, another value. Let me find this one, N1 bar. And this one is gonna be equal to I over K. I can also solve, solve for the N2 bar. And this one is gonna be equal to I over L and then N3, which will be equal to I divided by, exactly. So what are these values are? We have at this point, these are integers, N1s, N2s, and 3s are integers, Ks, L, and Ms are integers. So what is this N1 bar? This ratio that I have there, right? That would be the intercept between the plane and array that goes on B1. So this is the position of the intercept. You have a plane. Let's say you have a plane, right? Or a plane like this, whichever plane you want to choose here. And then this N1 is gonna give me the position of the intercept between this N1 and one of the lattices, one of the reciprocal lattices vectors. Does that make sense? And N2 and N3 give you the same thing, but for the other ones. So what we have is that we can, yeah? It gives us, well, I call it the position of the intercept. I don't know if it's the basis for it. So let's see, I'll show you an example in two dimensions and then you can see these two vectors, right? So that means that I can rewrite this K, L and M is gonna be equal to this I over N1 bar, I N2 bar and I N3 bar. All right, so let me now draw the following.
So this is supposed to be symmetric again. Maybe it's not. All right, so I just made this lattice right here. Two dimensional lattice, right? Questions before I start about this lattice? No? All right. So it has two vectors. Let me say that this point right here is zero, zero. This point right here. And you can see that there's two vectors here. This one, which I'm gonna call A1. And this one, which I'm gonna call A2. Questions? All right, no questions, right? I'm gonna put three planes on this. There's three planes right there, right? This line is sloping down to the right. I was trying to be careful in drawing this. Um, now that I see it, they don't look like they're the same plane as they go along, but they're supposed to be, right? They're a little crooked, but that's because my lattice points are crooked. So now that I have that, we have three lines. Where are the intercepts of those lines? So we have this plane, this plane, this plane. Those are my lines here. Planes in two dimensions become lines. So this is zero, zero. What is this point? So this is one. All right, so we do it in units of A1 and A2, right? So we go from here to here. What would be that point again? One zero, and then what is this point? No, sorry, zero one, right? Yeah, and then this point is? One zero, exactly. So what we wanna do is figure out what are the lines that are intercepting? So let's see, where's one one? If I go one one, right? One, one, so this is one, one. Let's find the point two, two. So this is zero, zero, one, two, two. Right here, this is two, two, and so forth, right? So you can see, let's see if this is two, two really. So I would go one, Two, one, one, yeah. So you can see that there's lines right there. And we have the points, we have the points right there, we have these planes. How would we find the vector that goes with that? So we have the one, one vector, right? What is the reciprocal of this intercept for this one, one?
What is the reciprocal of one? Okay, so yeah, if you're thinking, yeah. And if we just were to do it in this units, we would have one, one, right? Because we're looking at this index, right? KLM versus one, one. So that would be the reciprocal. If we were looking for all of the other points and then this two, two has another line right here, right? I didn't draw it, but there's a line that goes through here in this set of planes that is spread all the way to infinity. If we do that two, two, what are the reciprocals for two, two? Exactly. One half and one half. And this lines, we could, we know now one, one, two, two, we know the reciprocals. And we could do one, three, sorry, three, three, and three, three, whatever you would go in this infinite cell, you would also see lines passing through it. So what would be the Miller index? We want to multiply each of these intercepts, which are finding here to find the Miller indexes, right? So in this case, it's two dimensional. So this line right here gives us the one, one, right? So what do we have to multiply so that we get an index? Salud, an integer index for the one, one. What do you multiply one to get an integer back? One, right? What do you multiply the one half so that you get an integer back? Two, exactly. So all of these planes, we have to go with the smallest value, right? So those planes that are parallel to each other go through one, one, right? And those are the ones that we want. They're all one, one. This plane, as I put it here, is another plane, as I put it here, another plane, as I put it here, another plane, and another plane. It passes through the point one, one to one, one. So therefore, this is the one, one index, Miller index. All right, so this is the simplest one. Maybe it's the most confusing too. What happens if now, let me try to redraw it. Let me make a square lattice because it's easier now. Okay, so this is my square lattice. I'm gonna have A1 here, A2 here. And let's say that this one right here is zero, zero. So if I put that my plane is this ones, this would be the one, one plane, right? So what if my plane is going to go like this. So these are supposed to also be perpendicular parallel to each other. So there's, the one one was easy. This one is different, right? Because it's not passing through one one. Sorry. In this case, it's passing from zero two to one zero, exactly. 
So how would you set up, what would be the Miller indexes that give you this? So the one ones are passing through here. These ones are passing through here. Not, um, what would be the Miller indexes for this ones? So this is our plane, right? So we have a plane. We have our set of lattice points in the plane. And we have to figure out what is this uh, KL, in this case, just two, that will give us the integers, okay? And then we would find N1, which is some integer divided by K, N2, which is some integer divided by L, well, we don't want this integers. What we want is this K and L values. So there's two options, right? Which one is two and which one is one for this Miller index? Where does the plane? Okay, go for it, yeah. So you're, so two zero, would be in, so hold on, let me think. Uh, so, so let's see, it's not two zero because two zero. Right, so two zero, two zero, is it this one or this one? Right, so two zero would be that there's lines like this. So this is not two zero because the lines are not straight up and down. It's not zero two because the lines are not like this. So it's a combination of either two one or one two. Which one is it? Why do you say one two? All right, let me put this back over here, right? So we want this guy and this guy's, right? We have a set, a plane here. So you're saying two one, you're saying one two. two, one. two one. Who says two one? Who says one two? How do we fix this, Nikita? You're totally lost. <laughs> All right. So, um, we have two vectors here, A1 and A2. Which way is B1? Is that B1? All right. So, this is B1. And this one is B2. Because they're square, right? So if the line was going in this direction, the plane was going in this direction, when does, all right, so let me make another one right here. Let me make this line right here. This is another plane, okay? So for this new plane on the top, at what point does that plane, this one dimensional line right here that is called the plane in two dimensions, When does that one intercept with the G vector? So we have a G vector, one, one is equal to B1 plus B2. At what point does that line right here intercept with this vector B1? So 
So in the x axis, in the y axis, it's easy, right? When is it? One. One unit down, right? So it would be at negative one. Now in the x axis, this vector, the g1, b1, that goes like this, right? When does it intercept with this line? So it's not zero. It's parallel to it. Yeah, it's parallel to it. So if it's parallel, when does it intercept with it? At infinity. Right? It intercepts at infinity. So this plane right here is going to intercept that one at negative one and at infinity. So those two guys are our intercepts. Those are our intercepts that go here and here. So if we have infinity, some number, what is K? Sorry? Zero, exactly. And if the other one is negative one, what is L? So we will have one number. So, so some integer, negative one right here, L would be? One, exactly. So this new plane, because of this plus this, is the, we said zero right here, one plane. Make sense? All right, so then let's look at this line right here. If our lines was crossing one to one, it would be the one, one plane. But now we have to figure out, it goes down two, right? And it goes to the left or, okay, let's do it this way. He goes up, did I mess it up? No, I think we're right, yeah. So he goes like this, like this, like this. How does that vector, where does that vector intercept? Mm -hmm. intercepts add so the other one was neg at infinity and negative one right so here where do we see that it intercepts it intercepts if you go from here okay so we go from here to here you can see that it goes two directions and one and one so where is it going in two directions where is it going in one Mm -hmm. So where would it intercept our, let's say we had this vector. You almost have it. Yeah, so we would intercept, we would have something technically like two intercepts, I guess. Mm -hmm. But they would combine at one point. So the A1 would intercept at one point. So we have this vector, right? G11. And we know that it's, hold on. Sorry, no, 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 no. Yeah, all right. So yeah, we're almost there. We have it, this guy and this guy. You said two, one or one, two, the intercepts, right? Yeah. 
So this one was zero one, the plane. All of these guys were one one. Uh, so the question is, what are the intercepts for this guys and the G vector? So let me show you another hint. There's a vector that goes in that direction. That's the direction of our planes, right? This is perpendicular to this plane. What is this vector? One, two, or two, one? Two, one. So, that's the planes that we have here. And this family of planes is all identical. So this right here is repeated here, is repeated here, and so forth. So all of those planes are identical. And that would be the two one planes. So the one zero zero would be in the X direction. Zero one zero would be in the Y direction, right? This plane, and, keep, and you just keep going like that and building the planes. Salud. All right. So let's go back to our crystals. This crystal right here has planes. This is three dimensional, right? So I can have a plane that goes through here. So for instance, if this was the unit cell, right? There's a plane that is cutting through here, this plane, that also covers these atoms down here. There's a plane right here. So this is a two-dimensional plane. So something kind of like akin to going like this. That would be a plane in the X direction. So it's the one zero plane, right? Um, sorry, the zero one plane, zero one zero plane, X, Y, C. We have this other plane that goes in this direction. So if we say this is the X, this is the Y, right? Which plane is this one? When does this plane intercept with the X axis? All right, so is it the zero, one, zero, or one, zero, zero? That's a question. When does it intercept with the x-axis? This is the x-axis, and this is, and this plane gets repeated along in this direction. Yep. And when does it intercept the y-axis? Right. So, X direction, Y direction, this is the zero one zero plane. Then there's another plane that comes down here, right? That we're basically putting here. And this plane repeats here, here, here. So what is the family of this set of planes? Mm -hmm. What was that? Yeah. And it is the zero one, zero, one, zero, zero, or zero, zero, one. Okay. So that's what those axes mean in the cubic lattice. 
And then we also have another plane that can go like this, right? So you see how this one goes with the X and the Y. So this would be one, one, zero. Because it's never going to intercept with the C axis. And this, well, okay, let's go zero, zero, zero. Let's go again. Let me explain it again. C axis is going in that direction. And let's assume that this is the zero, zero, zero point, one, zero, 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 one, zero, right? So if I have this plane, this plane is repeated here. And that's the smallest integer, right? So this plane is gonna intercept the one and the one. So it's the one, one. And then the C axis just keep going in this direction up and this plane is a straight. So it's never gonna pass through the C axis. So it's gonna intercept it at infinity and that gives you the zero, one, one, zero. And then there's this one, this one, this one. When does this one intercept right here? Coming back to this one, it's gonna intercept from here and here. When does it intercept the X? It intercept at this point, right? When does it intercept the Y? Exactly. When does it intercept the C-axis? At infinity. So we know that the last digit is a zero. We know that the first digit was? No, this, this one has two numbers, right? So this is one, one. And then now I shifted it this way. So it went from... This one is one, one. What is this one now? When does it intercept? When does it intercept the y-axis? At two. So the intercept is at two. So that means that this one, okay, so now, now it makes sense. Okay. This one intercepts at one and one. So those two are integers, we divide it and we get one, one, zero. This one intercepts at two and one. So the intercept is at two. That means that the plane should be one half, right? Sorry, the, 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 in, the inverse of it, the reciprocal is one half. Then we multiply this one by two, so that we get the one, two. One, two, infinity. So. All right, so does this make sense? We're gonna have one, two, three, one. Zero, zero. One, zero. Zero, two. So intercepts are zero, two, and one, zero. So reciprocals are zero, one half, and one zero again. So then we need to multiply to get all integers. And we would get the two, one plane. And if we go Keep going like that. Does that make sense? All right. One last one. Now, this is a trickiest one.
So this is my zero, zero, one, zero, 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 one, zero, zero, two, zero, 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 one, zero, one, one, zero, and so forth. This is my lattice, and then here is going to be another one right here. So this is zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one, zero. And what is this one right here? All right, awesome. So now let's say that our plane is going to cut through, going to cut through here through here and through here. Make sense? If I twist it a little bit higher up and it's not passing through zero, zero, one, but rather zero, zero, two, then I have to multi, that's gonna intercept at one half, no, sorry, at two. So my inverse of that is one half, and I will have to multiply everything by two. So I will have the one, the two, two, one. And if this intercept, instead of being at zero, zero, one, was at one half, right? Then I would have not the one, 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 but the one, one, two. So the flat ones are easier, but these ones are also easy to see now, right? Like it makes sense. So if we look at something like this, right? If we look at this monster right here, you guys can see the planes. And now you have that this thing right here, this is the sink blend structure. And these two unit cells plus two unit cells in the X, two unit cells in the Y, and one unit cell in the C direction. So this three dimensional figure right here, you can see the planes coming out of it. So crystals all grow and expose different facets of them. If this crystal right here, if that's, those were the planes that were cut from it, that's the surface of it. Now you know that it's growing in that direction. If this is the end and it caps right here, it was growing in that direction and you would know what these planes are. So crystals, when they're growing, they grow and facet themselves by cutting off, by having planes like this. And then one of those planes is just gonna be the one that goes all the way to the surface. This uh, Miller indices would be the places where the crystal grit gets cleaved. So if you have a diamond lattice, the facets of them correspond to certain Miller indices. Maybe it's the one, 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 and the one, one, two, and all of those, when you have those facets as they go around the crystal that you have those in the diamond, each of them is one of these Miller indices planes. So those, those are also where crystal cleaves. So I don't know if any of you knows about how a crystal breaks, but it would be along this place. And cleaving means hitting it so that it breaks apart. So for instance, if you have a crystal and you just hit it, a rock, for instance, the rock is gonna crack and open up like that, right? Well, for crystals, it's even simpler than that. And they would just cleave along the Miller indices and it's a flat surface right there. Exactly. That's the main thing. If that's a good Miller index, then that's where it's, where it's gonna cleave. And when you're growing things too, you are growing in different directions. So this is two different planes. This plane, okay, here it is. This plane that has the gray balls right here. So you have, um, you can see that the gray balls are in this plane and this plane. 
those are different than this plane and this plane. So your unit cell would be one that has those balls in it completely so that it can tile. It's not this little tiny cube right here, but it's rather this whole cube that goes around like this. That's your unit cell. And these guys appear at positions in the plane. Exactly. So if, a, if you have a substrate that has a facet, let's say one zero zero, and you're growing things on it, they're gonna grow up in that direction too. So that's the way that things grow. They like to grow in the same direction as the substrate below them. They don't wanna be on top of each other if there's a mismatch. It would be like balancing two chairs on top of each other, right? How do you balance two chairs on top of each other? You just stick them in the same direction. If you put one chair like this and the other one like this, and then they're just gonna be unstable. Same with how the atoms grow. All right, so with this, I have finished most of the stuff that is in chapter two of the book. We have gone into parts that are in chapter three already. I have almost finished the homework set that I'm gonna give you. It's gonna be uploaded today. And it's covering things like this, like the lattices and all of that. The one thing that is different that I haven't covered is how cells pack. So let me give you an example. Let's say that we had a cube right here. The camera is on, all right. Let me change this. So we have a, a square of area is equal to one, okay? So let's say that this was my unit cell. And my unit cell is that I'm gonna have a square lattice right here. Let's assume that they're symmetrically inside of there. And how big can I make these circles? This circle right here is, is this big, right? So let's say that the area of that guy was one. And this is my radius. Let's assume that it's symmetric, right? So that's my radius, right? So if I take this circle right here, what's the area of the circle? pi r square, right? All right, so what's the surface of the cube? One. Then I can put this number into my calculator and figure out how big this circle is. And because there's one fourth right here, one fourth right here, one fourth right here, and one fourth right here, I'll have this much area occupied by the circle, right? So at this point, what is the packing fraction? How much area are the circles using compared to the unit volume that I had? Volume, volume area of one that I have up here. So at this point, you just do the calculation and you put it in there, right? So that would be the packing fraction. So essentially this uh, packing fraction is just the uh, amount of space uh, occupied. Exactly.
All right, so let me come back to this one now. In this, we have how much area are the circles using? So let's say area of a square is again one in whatever units I'm using. Area occupied by circles in a square. So I have one full circle right here. And I have one, two, three, four quarters, right? Is the area of two circles. Make sense? So now if I have the packing fraction, I would figure out what this radius is. At this point, I haven't given you the radius, but I can put what radius that is. All right, so what is the packing fraction? Would be the area of the occupied by circles divided by the area of the square. And there's a limit, right? Because if you have, let's say now we have that same thing. Now let's say that my circles are big. And then there's a big circle in the middle. So if the circles were touching with each other, that's the maximum that I can get, right? If I make this bigger, I make this bigger, and then they start to touch. So there's a limit. And even though, even if I pull the full, this guy by itself right here, it's not gonna be the same area as my square. So if I have so this is again a body center cubic right here because there's a circle in the center. But we could make one that goes like this. So this is circle, this is the other circle, this is the other circle. And you see that the areas of the circles right here. This is the area of one circle, right? It's the four quarters of each of them. This one is all of this empty space in the circle. Here, my empty space would be like a little portion here, 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 here. So this one is packing better than this one. And that's one of the homework problems that you have, but in three dimensions. So you're gonna have spheres. They're gonna be so that they are touching, what is the packing fraction? If they're not touching, but they're this big, what is the packing fraction? So that's the one only thing that I haven't put in there so far. But the rest of the stuff for the homework, we have done in class. And if not, just ask me if you are confused about anything. on Thursday for sure. All right, so that's it for today. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So for instance, this packing fraction, if this were touching, there would be a small area right here, right here, right, that is empty. So this area is empty here, here, here. And in this one, all of this area is empty. So you see that this one has lower packing fraction than this one already. So this is more efficient at packing than this one. You don't want empty spaces in there if you wanna be more efficient at packing. All right, well, that's it for today. And I'll see you all on Thursday. Bring your homework so you can show us how you did the problems, okay? You can plan for about 10 minutes in a discussion for each of the problems, and I'll just ask for volunteers on Thursday. <laughs>